one. We're now on, um, so it's 9.30, sorry, on the 15th of April. We now have the Growth Infrastructure and Waste Committee, um, number 2021-3. The first thing we'll do is take council attendance, and I can see that all the councillors are in, in attendance. Good morning. And so there are no apologies. May I ask for any declarations of interest on any of the matters on the agenda today? There being no declarations of interest, I'll move on to the next item, which is business outstanding. There's no business outstanding. We'll now move on to the confirmation of the minutes. So item one, would anyone like to ask the relevant council officer any questions on the minutes? No, I'll then ask for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Island. A seconder. Thank you, Councillor Morgan. Any discussion on those minutes? No, I'll put the matter to the vote. Those in favour, please raise your hand. Thank you, it's unanimous and passed. I'm going to move a procedural motion, and I haven't had a chat to chat to you all about it, but I'd like to change um, item number 10, which is South East Queensland Council of Mayors Regional Waste Management Plan. I'd like to move that to be just behind item six, which is the Waste and Circular Economy Transformation Directive. I think it'll be a smoother order, as we'll be, our head will sort of be in that, that waste and circular economy space. I think it'll be a, a smoother transition for our agenda. So I'd like to move that. Do I have a seconder for that? Thank you, Councillor Kunzelman. Any discussion on that? I'll put the matter to the vote. Those in favour, please raise your hand. And it's unanimous and carried. Thank you very much for, the, for that. We'll now move on to item two, which is the procurement uh, delegation for the CO to enter into a contract under the local by contract for the supply of street lighting um, electricity. Um, would anyone like to ask the relevant council officer any questions? On this one? No? That case, I'll ask for someone to move and I propose that we move all five items together for this. Do I have a mover for this? Thank you, Councillor Fickner. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Kunzelman. I'll open the matter up for discussion. No, I think it's, just, it's a standard um, agreement to go out. And I know that in the market, we need, you can only go out and, have a, and you have a five-day turnaround, I think. I understand, CEO, uh, to do this. That's do correct. This. Yep. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. In that case, I'll put the matter to the vote. Those in favour, please raise your hand. Thank you. It's unanimous and carried. We'll now move on to item three which is the acquisition of volumetric title, Lot 1, Unnamed Road, Springfield. Would anyone like to speak to the relevant council officer on this item? I th that would be good. The so we have the relevant council officer. Yeah, it's just yes. a query We've about got the, uh, the position of it. I think Councillor Tully will be questioning the position of the... Can you please state your name and job title, please? Uh, Senior Property Officer Paul Lee from Property Services. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is the matter we discussed um, two or three weeks ago, is that right? Yes. In, in the briefing, yeah. It's just the, the reference to the unnamed road. Like, like I thought that was a named road. That's right. But what, what constitutes the unnamed road? My apologies, Councillor Tully. Can I get you to put turn the microphone on? Is it green? You'd like to press the white tape. Yep. Is it green now? Yes. Yes, it's green now. Yep. Thank you very this much. My apologies. This is the underground tunnel. Yes, yes, a pedestrian underpass the under the road. Over yes. to the parklands. Yeah, but but which part of it's unnamed? I don't know why it's called the unnamed, but it's the it's the arterial road that it, it runs under, and there's Eden Station Road next to it. But I've, that's just been put through in the report. I can't answer that question. Sure. Yeah, I, Do you know that it's question? just a bit confusing to me. Perhaps, <coughs> perhaps the heading and when this appears in the report, we should put the name of the, the name Springfield Green Bank Arterial. Mm. Yes, fair yeah, comment. Yes. Just, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it was just a little confusing okay. too. Mm. Yeah, that, it, that had that reference. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions of, of Mr. Lee? I guess, Mr Lee, um, from what I can see, there was works done a number of years ago. We're now remediating some of the works that we... Also yes. The drainage. Yes, correct. I suppose yeah, as part of the drainage solution, we need to acquire the um, that title uh, and that'll um, allow us now to 
to help do the drainage works on the, at the college, at Thank the school. You. Thank you. Any risks or concerns from your part? Uh, no, uh, we've started, we've had uh, without prejudice conversations with the uh, the college, mm -hmm. and they seem um, they're giving in principle support at the moment. Okay. We have had evaluation done, and we have uh, done a without prejudice offer to them at this mm -hmm. stage, and they're considering it in their next board meeting. So okay. we will hear back from them soon. Yeah. Mayor, I've just got one more Thank question. Thank you, yes. Councillor Taylor. Will, will this the drainage um, the, the, to be done at some stage? Will that uh, benefit the school directly as well? I think it'll benefit the school in, in the fact that it has created an issue with the drainage in the first instance by blocking oh. the underpass. So by buying the underpass, uh, closing it down as an underpass and also um, sort of it, we want to buy the underpass, close it off and then the drainage works just on the, uh, I suppose, the eastern side of the road. Yes. Yes. Okay. But that can't occur while, if, while that underpass exists. Yeah, I understand that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions of Mr Lee? Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Appreciate Thank you. it. May I have someone please move this motion? Thank you, Councillor Doyle. A seconder. Thank you, Councillor Fickner. I now open the matter up for discussion. No discussion. I'll then move the uh, the report. I'll move all those four all those four recommendations together. If that's okay, Councillor Doyle and Councillor Fickner. Um, those in favour, please raise your hand. I see that's unanimous and passed. Thank you. We now move on to item four, which is the Springfield Domain Parklands Management. May I have the relevant council officer come to the lectern, please? Is that your name and your position? Richard White, manager of procurement. Thank you, Mr White. Uh, Mr White, I know that there's a, a confidential attachment here and I don't, don't wish to go into that, but I guess I look at the fact that this is a, a supplier that's wanting to have an additional increase to their contract outside their current contract. Uh, this contractor has contracts with for other pools. Yes. What would be the... If this did go through, would there be any flow-on impact to those other contracts? Uh, we, we do have six contracts with this supplier, mm -hmm. similar arrangements, although some are lease, um, not a service agreement such as this. Um, the ascertained sort of risk assessment on this occurring is low. So similar agreements that we've entered into are later uh, and are more appropriate pricing structures mm -hmm. than this, this pricing structure. So it's probably a disadvantage, disadvantageous structure for both parties. So, well, for them. But uh, low risk that this will occur again. Okay. Thank you, Mr. White. Any other questions of Mr. White? Yes, Councillor Tully? Yes. It's just, um, this is just a uh, clarification of this as well in the name. It's, the headings Springfield Domain Parklands Management. Well, we've got, we've got Rebel Domain, and I understand we've got Springfield Central Parklands as the uh, linear parklands there. Um, I'm wondering how that sort of nomenclature has come into the uh, report? Uh, that's, the, the, that's the direct title of the contract. Um, th so contract 1415-108, okay. Springfield Domains Parkland. So it's uh, when they were structuring that contract Except when you, in 1415. When, when you go to the executive summary, it talks about Ramel Domain Stage 2 Parklands Management Agreement. It, it uses a different yeah, expression true. there. And in the summary, yeah. I, th I think that the, the, the summary should indicate, uh, well, it is Rebel Domain, mm. or part of it, and I think it should you know, be a, a little, little bit clearer because that, that just introduces another name into the community which has never been a, a descriptor of, of either yeah. Rebel Domain or, or the wider parklands um, which Rebel, Rebel Domain is part of. I'll, I'll explore yeah. why the title was that way. It makes, yeah, I understand. Yeah. It, I so could I just add that if, if that is in the, in the in the contract, I understand that, but for the purposes of the report and the subject, it, it, it should have that broader dis to make, yeah. description of the, of the location. I guess, Mr White, uh, the question probably would be, um, we've got the 1415-108 Rebel Domain Stage 2. Mm. 
Let's there see. may be a number of pro contracts. Do you mind coming back to us with the structure I'll of clarify, that? yes. Yeah. Yep. So we can understand that and we may need to change it. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, you mentioned before that it was disadvantageous to both parties currently. Can you just expand on that? Well, uh, from our from the Ipswich City Council side, why is it disadvantageous <coughs> to the council? Uh, so we'd say reputational. So we this is a services contract. So this is our lifeguards and, and yep. that we have on on and um, the structuring of the agreement didn't consider consider. Fair Work Australia's uh, increases to the rates for those kind of services. So we were essentially paying them knowing that we were paying them less than what um, was an appropriate rate for that service. Okay. So reputationally, we shouldn't have entered into a contract that was structured that way. Mm. Um, so this is a more appropriate structuring of that contract for the price. It was based on CPI only. Okay. And obviously last year CPI actually went down, so we would have been if we followed the letter of the contract, we would have decreased the amount of money we were paying them this year um, for the services they were providing. And was that, um, is there a number of other contracts, service contracts like no, this? So the later, later agreement that we entered into for, so the last one we entered into with them for March 2020, um, so this is quite an old agreement uh, for the Rosewood pool, I believe, no. River Heart, sorry, um, was structured the way we're now restructuring this one. So it's bringing it into line to how we structure these contracts okay. um, now. So that's why there's a low risk that this is going to happen repeatedly. Yeah. It's more we're modernising the structure of this. Thank you. This is Council Island. Um, not quite about the goods and services. Are you off your microphone? Oh, sorry. Not quite about the goods and service categories, but what's the long-term plan for the Orion Lagoon? I'd have to throw to Sean for that one. That would uh, be a for different the general manager of the environment. Oh, just before before Mr. White goes, are there any other questions about the procurement <coughs> of these services or the, the Yes. I'll just go to Council Cornsma while if that's okay. If, if your is, microphone. If about, Your microphone. Sorry. If this is about wages, are you saying that other contracts are covered for that? Yes. So the the later contract because otherwise you'd expect there to be a yeah, so uh, the contract that was entered into in 2020, um, which is very similar to this with the same supplier, is structured with um, wages included as a... So we index base... So indexing on contracts generally for goods uh, is by, based on CPI. Um, when you are looking at a contract that's largely wages, you should consider um, that CPI and wages often move at different paces. Um, so we structure this based on Fair Work Australia's... So, so you're saying you can set a figure to, to predict what... Wage increases there might be. Well, we uh, we structure the contract saying that we will consider each year what is published ah, um, by Fair Work, and then then we consider the annual um, increase. Yeah. So usually the so the previous structure of this was just CPI, the published CPI, which we look at every year, and CPI last year actually went down um, because of a lot of things that happened, um, while wages actually increased for lifesavers and. Um, security service and stuff that they, they provide under this contract. So it was back in 14, 15 when this originally was established, it was probably not considered appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. Might I just want someone in this area here has their phone off silent. Could you please put it on silent? Two, two dings have gone off. Any other questions of Mr White? Thank you, Mr White. Thank you. Mr Madigan, would you mind coming to the lectern? Please state your name and title. <coughs> Good morning, Mayor and Councillors. Sean Madigan, General Manager of Infrastructure and Environment. Council Island. Mr Madigan, um, I'm just wondering what the... Microphone. <laughs> I'm just wondering what the long-term plan for Orion Lagoon would be. Um, considering that we may have to undertake some repairs at some stage, mm -hmm. would we start to look at fencing the area? Uh, permanently fencing it so that, you know, because we have to put up portable fencing, which probably costs a fortune mm. anyway. Yeah. Um, in <clears throat> response to that, that is uh, an option that is available. It isn't one that has been actively explored um, by Council as yet, um, but um, as the Council would be aware, it, it is a significant cost um, to operate uh, the lagoon, um, and at present there is no form of cost recovery in relation to it. 
so if if the council was interested in pursuing uh, us to explore that option of, of fencing and cost recovery, that is something that we could factor in and present back to council if required. But that certainly hasn't been explored at any time, to my knowledge. Uh, certainly not in the last since the, the lagoon has been built. I, I guess uh, just looking at um, if we had to do repairs to it and we had to empty water, mm. how would you block it off so that? <coughs> Would you have to empty the whole pool, or how would that work? Uh, it's my understanding. So the the as uh, has been presented to council previously, there have been leaks uh, in the lagoon as a result of settlement. Uh, we have been able to to patch those uh, whilst the lagoon is is filled with water. Um, we expect um, that other issues may arise in relation to settlement, and we'll be able to patch those um, under the water. Uh, however, in the event that, that a significant repair um, is required in, say, 10 to 20 years, you would have to drain the entire lagoon. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions, Mr Madigan? Yes, Councillor Tully? Just aligned with that, I, I think the fencing of it permanently would um, uh, be a very poor aesthetic. Uh, because of the um, the width of the lagoon, so you'd have double fencing within close proximity, and I'd never be supportive of charging people for that. It'd be a bit like Brisbane at South Bank deciding to charge you to be the most unpopular decision, yeah, ever made um, by the council to charge to attend a Ryan lagoon. So, with all due respect, uh, Councillor Island, I think it's something we shouldn't consider. Thank you, Councillor Tully. So, any questions of Mr. Madigan? Oh. No, I don't expect okay. him to answer at I'll, this stage. I'll, I'll, ask, I'll, I'll ask people to keep their comments and discussion points in, in future. But thank you, Mr. Council. Any other questions of Mr. Madigan? Thank you, Mr. Madigan. Thank you. I now ask for someone to um, move this motion. Thank you, Councillor Jonick. A seconder. Thank you, mm. Councillor Doyle. I'll open up the matter for discussion. Um, sorry, Councillor Tully, if you wanted to... Uh, yeah, I only raised that because it had been raised in the earlier discussion, just to, just to put my position on the record. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. I guess in my view, and, and reading the confidential attachment as well, which does show the profit margin for, for the supplier, and, and I've got to say they provide an excellent service. I've never had a complaint about uh, the condition of the, of the lagoon. It is, is a hugely popular attraction. And I do note that um, it's great that the supplier does make a healthy profit. I do note that um, with the Fair Work um, Commission uh, increases, their profit does look to reduce around 20%, but they're still making a healthy profit. I often think that we are seen as a soft touch as, as a council or a level of government. Um, you know, we did enter into a fixed price contract for, for 10 years. And we do pay, I think, at, at the moment, more than $1.5 million a year for that maintenance contract, um, as well as obviously council tax on the, the, the cost, other costs of water and, and other things and maintenance around the area as well. So I, I know it's been moved and seconded. Um, I guess I'm indicating at this stage, I'm open to discussion, but my, my, um, my, at this stage my support would be for the CPI increase, but not for the uh, fair work um, increase. I think that's something that the business needs to, to bear themselves. They entered into a competitive open tender. Uh, they knew they would have to take into consideration the cost of the uh, rise of wages, and that's something that they should have done during that. And I don't think them coming back to us halfway through, um, telling us that um, they didn't factor that in, is not something that the council or the ratepayers of Ipswich should have to factor in. But look, I, I'm open to discussion on, on, on um, the views in the table. Um, I, I agree with your comments, I guess, in principle, Mayor, um, just noting that it is an invaluable, um, some of the aspects of the contract are just an invaluable service, and I note that to date there hasn't been performance issues around that, but if, if we um, look at it purely from, you know, we are a contractual party, and, and why should the ratepayers um, bear the cost um, of of the party mm. not factoring in appropriate um, increases. Mm. Thank you, Councillor, Councillor Fickner. Um, I guess if those increases aren't incorporated into the final um, agreement to vary the contract, 
Um, my concern lies with the potential uh, service standard mm -hmm. lowering. Sure. So I guess we need to be very familiar with um, the contract manager of this particular contract mm -hmm. and how familiar they are with current service levels um, and how potentially this might affect those moving forward if we decide not to go ahead uh, mm -hmm. with that increase. Will there be... Uh, you know, I understand that they have their own um, risk management um, and their own, um, you know, the amount of lifeguards there um, is, up, is up to them. However, um, you know, are we, are we erring on the side of potentially pushing risk position to what is, mm. um, you know, a really valuable council asset that we spend lots of money on um, and it's never had an incident there before and we'd hate to see that mm. service level drop and, and therefore something potentially devastating happening there too. So I'm just very <laughs> conscious of what that might mean for the service level if we decide um, not to proceed um, mm. to subsidise um, those wages as well. Just my thoughts. Mm. I'm not sure what any of the others mm. are thinking right now. Thank you, now. Councillor Vickner. I'd like to f for further discussion. Yes, Councillor Tully. Yeah, I just... Um um, the people who are sort of smarter than me in relation to these uh, technical issues and what's appropriate, but I note that six officers have recommended that both elements be included, um, have signed the report um, going through to um, including uh, six. Yep. general manager, um, an acting general manager in that position. Could, could we just... Um, Get a because this the discussion didn't come up with the questions mm. to uh, Mr. Madigan. Can we just get an indication in relation to that specific issue about the inclusion or exclusion of that element, or why they're recommending that it be included? Yep. Um, might have the relevant council officer to discuss why um, about the the Fair Work Commission component being included. Who would be the relevant person? Mr. Madigan, thank you. Tully had a question. Yeah. Uh, Sean Madigan, well, General Manager of Infrastructure. Yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. It, it's just that, that specific issue that's been recommended for inclusion as, mm -hmm. as the two elements in, in the uh, variation. And could you just explain um, why that's being recommended? Is that a normal um, contractual provision? Um, and uh, how, how might that relate to other contracts? And has, have we done that before uh, with other contracts? Yeah. Um, speaking in relation to this specific uh, item, um, this is, in our view, uh, the initial contract that was drafted and, and issued um, didn't take into account effective um, you know, Fair Work Commission increases. Um, you can't really necessarily factor those in until they occur. Um, given the fact that they occurred post-implementation uh, of the uh, contract, it was viewed um, by ourselves that, you know, as... Um, if you will, a model employer, um, you know, even though uh, this is a contracted agent of ours performing this service, um, that we would acknowledge um, the Fair Work Commission's decision in relation to a minimum wage um, and in our contracts not encourage uh, providers to be paying below uh, minimum wage. And, and you'd be aware of the various I issues that are arising across industries about employees being underpaid. Um, so as, as a council, um, given that it isn't a significant increase per annum over the course of the contract, um, we believe that ethically uh, it is the, the appropriate thing to do to ensure that anyone who is performing services on behalf of council is being paid in accordance uh, with the, the minimum wage. Uh, if we do not do that, um, the very nature of a, of a commercial industry is that um, potentially they will squeeze uh, the current resources even further, um, which may result in a reduction of the level of service being provided at the lagoon. Um, we are extremely happy with the service that has been provided um, at the lagoon by, by Australian Cruel. Um, as you'd be aware, Councillor Tully, it has been open for many years now and, uh, as you said, the, the level of, of um, preparation, cleanliness and supervision, uh, more importantly, um, is, is probably at one of the highest levels for this sort of a, a, um, an asset that's heavily used by the community. Uh, I'm not really in a position to uh, comment on other uh, contracts. Uh, Mr White perhaps may be more appropriate um, to answer that question in relation to other contracts and whether they're going through a similar process in regards to uh, other contracts that exist across Council that are considered legacy ones and potentially inappropriate for the given times. 
Yeah, thank you. That that covers that. And I might just say that I think given that circumstance. So if it's the, a discussion point, I'll ask you to do it. Oh, sorry. Oh, my apologies for that. In, yeah. yeah. That, that, that I'd be um, supportive of um, maintain, uh, voting for the uh, current wording of the uh, proposed recommendation. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Madigan. Thank you. Mayor, yes, while yeah. not required, might I add a comment in the hope yes. that it's, it's helpful that I imagine that at the time this agreement was struck, it wasn't contemplated that the CPI might reduce its... Um, uh, I am no expert, but uh, according to the ABS, uh, there has, has only been three times uh, that the CPI has in fact reduced. Uh, the microphone's on. The microphone's on. <laughs> Will we put, turn it off and turn it on again? Should I start again? Can you hear me? Turn her up, yeah. OK, thank you. <laughs> Check my voice. Um, so to comment that I, I imagine and suppose that at the time the agreement was struck, the possibility of the CPI reducing may not have been contemplated by the, by the parties at the time. <coughs> the fact that it is uh, reasonably unusual that the CPI has decreased. Uh, uh, according to the ABS, uh, it has occurred twice before in the 1940s and 1970s. Um, so, as the confidential attachment notes, and without going into that, the, the reduction in the CPI has been applied to the supplier in this case. And so, the officer's recommendation to align this agreement with the other recently negotiated agreement for River uh, Heartlands um, is to, I guess, balance the CPI and the Fair Work Commission uh, increases rather than simply going with uh, FWC alone by balancing. In fact, if there is a further negative reduction of the CPI, that you know, mitigates any increases that would be applied. And, and as Mr White noted, that's how the more recent agreement with this supply has been negotiated with both CPI and FWC. It certainly is unusual to be um, considering this um, recommendation, uh, and you know, officers did consider that uh, carefully in, in putting forward the report. Thank you. Thank you, CEO. Any other discussion? I guess in speaking to the points that have been raised, I'll say that in the contract there are certain service levels that have to be maintained. And I think, you know, in all my years of procurement, when you've got a 10-year contract, you do, you know, you do make it, you do accommodate the cost of, of salaries and, and so on. And if we're talking about um, ensuring that the supplier pays a, the minimum wage and is, does that legally, um, I do know in the confidential document that there is a, still a healthy profit, very healthy profit in this contract, and whilst the profit has reduced about 20%, it's still a, an incredibly profitable enterprise, and it should be. We want the, the person, the supplier, to be a, a, a successful, profitable business. Um, I guess I'll, with that, I will then... Move it to the vote. Those in favour of this um, recommendation, this report, please raise your hand. I see Councillor, F Councillor Doyle, Councillor Fechner, Councillor Tully, Councillor Johnny, Councillor Island, Councillor Madsen, Councillor Milligan, and Councillor Kunzelman. Support it. Those against? It's just me, I think. Thank you. And so it was passed. Thank you. Item five. Writing the revolution. Would anyone like to speak to the relevant council officer on this? Uh, yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> ask for the relevant council officer. Please state your name and your job title. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Cartledge. I'm a senior transport planner for Council's Infrastructure and Environment Department. Thank you very much. Councillor Fickner. Thank you for the reply. Thanks for the reply to my notice of motion. Um, there's plenty of information to digest here and I appreciate um, the time taken to, um, to try and implement some of the recommendations of the report into our future strategies. Um, just a couple of questions. Uh, when we're talking about, um, the, re the report refers to uh, gold-plated infrastructure um, and um, 
and possibly the need to uh, lower the standard of the infrastructure delivered. Um, the report says here, um, on page 60, I'm on, um, further, in relation to delivering faster and cheaper cycle projects, there is potentially a need for a commitment from Council to accept a higher level of project risk in terms of safety and technical de design standards. Does that mean a formal direction from the elected representatives um, to operate differently um, in, in terms of our views on what our risks might be? I think it, it goes back to uh, historically in the past, council has only um, funded the principal bikeway projects if they receive grant funding. Uh, to receive the grant funding from the TMR, they have standards that are above Austroad standards. So that's why we have always resulted in um, having bikeways that could be perceived as sort of gold-plated. Um, I guess there would need to be a commitment from Council to consider funding these bikeway projects, regardless of whether they receive grant funding or not, and then that then has potential implications in terms of, well, OK, are we all right with just going with Austroad standards? Are there specific circumstances where we do want to go a bit further or a bit less. And so that's probably a bit more of a broader discussion for risk and things like that as well. Um, do you know if the department has ever considered what it might look like um, if, we're not, um, if, we're, if we're not complying uh, with those standards that are imposed on us um, that, we, that we need to achieve when we get those co-contributions? Have we ever considered what it might look like um, the, the types of infrastructure that we might be able to deliver um, if there is political will um, to, to do so. We're actually almost at that situation right now. Um, we've had a few past projects um, that are grant funded where we're having quite a lot of difficulty actually achieving um, the TMR standards and it, we're sort of at the point of weighing up is it benefit to stick with the grant funding program or do we go it alone and then what does that look like? Uh, so I think we're investigating that currently. And I appreciate that it's a big cost um, and a big hit to the capital program if we decide to roll out um, projects like that. Um, in the report here, and we've seen in the uh, capital um, program, the three-year rolling program, the mention of the um, Eastern Bikeway link. Um, how far progressed are we in, in actually planning and identifying that link? Yeah, sure. So uh, strategic level planning, um, it's outlined in the Principal Cycle Network Plan and the IGO Active Transport Action Plan, stages one and two, uh, which run from the intersection of Thorn Street and South Street um, up, back up through um, along Limestone Street and Queen Victoria Parade. Mm -hmm. They've already received detailed design grant funding, uh, so they're in detailed design at the moment. Um, and right. then for the section that runs along Glebe Road, um, I'm in the process of writing the specification documentation to do a corridor planning study along that section now. Um, and just while, while we're... And, and this might be a little bit off topic, but um, the closure of Glebe Road, is that having any influence on... Um, the speed with which you're moving on that planning? It's actually um, quite good timing. Uh, so it'll most <coughs> likely be that the TMR design will help inform our Glebe Road design, but there's also opportunity for us to have discussions with TMR about what that design may look like. So it's working out quite well at the moment. <clears throat> in terms of projects uh, that we have in the pipeline, there's a really interesting um, there's really interesting commentary in the report, and I'm looking at page 92, um, when we're talking about um, those joint programs with the state government um, and the principal cycle um, network uh, plans, um, there's, a, there's just a little bit of commentary in the third to last dot point here um, around the prioritisation of these projects and how we're considered um, in TMR within the same metropolitan regional office, um, which can create project priority mismatch as a cycle project in Brisbane City Council LGA. And I and I know this this isn't this isn't um, proven fact, but uh, we we postulate here and say maybe perceived as better value for money um, with the state. 
Um, so just in terms of those projects that we put up to the state, do we have quite a few that, that they're aware of and that are in direct competition with those that Brisbane City Council are putting forward as well? I suppose I'd wish to clarify that comment in the report. That's in relation to projects that are delivered specifically by TMR on state controlled roads or state assets. So um, projects that are delivered through the local government grants program, separate. Mm -hmm. um, this point refers to projects, cycle specific projects that are delivered specifically by TMR because they're on state controlled roads. So um, for example, uh, for a cycle only project that has no sort of road component involved, it may be perceived by the TMR Metropolitan Region Office that it's better value for money for them to invest in the Brisbane LGA due to um, population surrounding the route and demand forecasts than perhaps on a, on a specific cycle-only project in Ipswich where we may have lower demand forecasts. Yeah. So I'll, I'll narrow the scope of the question. Um, are we aware of what types of projects sit with TMR that exist within our LGA? Um, there's mention of the Dinmore... Uh, yep. the connection between Dinmore yep. and Ipswich CBD. So um, the only cycle specific project I'm aware of in Ipswich LGA at the moment is the connection um, from Logan to Springfield Central along the Centenary Highway. In specific regards to the Brisbane Road, it is most likely that a cycle specific project as I understand won't happen. Any cycle upgrades will happen as part of road upgrades and at the moment I am only aware of potential intersection upgrades. So because it's a principal cycle route, they ha as part of their cycling policy, they have to specifically incorporate cycling infrastructure in their upgrades as part of that. So it's likely we might see some future bike lanes as part of an intersection upgrade, potentially, nothing confirmed. Right. Um... That's all from me, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions of Ms Cartledge? No, thank you very much. Thank you. May I have a mover for this motion? Councillor Fick, no, I'm assuming. Thank you. A seconder? Thank you, Councillor Lingard. And I'll open the matter up for discussion. Um, I just, I'd probably like to say to the group here that um, it's, you know, al although we face very difficult budget discussions and decisions that we need to make as a group, uh, I think that we're in a good place to start thinking a little, more, a little bit more strategically about how we perceive active mm -hmm. transport and not the benefits, you know, that we'll see in the next five to ten years, but when we're talking about building better cities and looking to the future, um, you know, what, what, do, what do those interactions between, uh, you know, bikes and our critical infrastructure look like? Um, you know, how do we improve the health and well-being of the broader population, of which we have significant issues, mm -hmm. by promoting these sorts of ways of getting around? And it's not just active transport specific, you know, it's, a, it's about the conversation around people being more active mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we, we know that, and it's not just Ipswich specific, but we're severely lacking um, in that type of community activity when we're, we're actually getting out and, um, you know, focusing on mm -hmm. our health. So active transport has, you know, wider implications in that, you know, you're promoting the health and well-being of communities uh, while also reducing the costs of, you know, future infrastructure mm -hmm. potentially. And there's so many great examples around the world uh, where they incorporate, you know, active transport um, in, into, the, into the main um, traffic network and mm -hmm. it just works so perfectly. Um, we're in a situation where we look to Brisbane and, and see the band-aids that they're slapping on and the trouble that it's causing them uh, right now. You know, our population um, you know, while growing rapidly, it's still at a manageable rate when it comes to starting to think about and, and plan these things. So um, I'd just like to, you know, lobby the rest of the councillors in this room to really consider moving into budget discussions. How are we thinking about solving these future problems so as to ensure a high level of intergenerational equity and to, and to make sure that we're doing the right thing by our constituents, by planning for the future. Mm. Um, you know, it's easy to think about this as cyclists versus cars, and, it, and, and, it abs and the dialogue absolutely needs to lift, and, and there is a commitment, um, you know, from me, and, and we've got a cycle forum coming up mm -hmm. uh, later this year, 
Um, but it, we also want to include people who walk to work, who walk to school, mm. who you know, who ride recreationally um, on the weekends. Uh, it's it's m it's more than just uh, people um, commuting, um, and and rather it's about everyone getting out and and being active. Mm. And the cost saving to the city, um, you know, in seventy years' time uh, would be absolutely uh, ginormous. Mm. Thank you, Councillor Fechner. I think the, the the whole report, I think in in principle, is is quite visionary. It's you know, it's, it's it's putting it out there, saying this is this is a path forward, and and I, I appreciate the understanding of some of the recommendations of perhaps putting up those pop up bike lanes on a Sunday. I mean, just on the weekend, the Sunday Mail had a had a story about the the pop up bike lanes or the bike lanes in in the CBD of, of Brisbane and the massive impact it's actually had on those local businesses because people can't park there now. And so their businesses have dropped dramatically uh, because of that. Um, so I think it's really, so it's really nice to see that, that those nuances were, were there to, to be practical. There's a couple of things in there that I thought that were quite unreasonable. Um, one of the recommendations about, and you mentioned that the fast, cheap and connected and not gold-plated. I mean, from a project management perspective, you're looking at cost, schedule and quality. I mean, if you want it fast, you don't get it cheap and the quality's not there. Um, if you want it cheap, you're not going to get it quick and you're not going to have the quality. So it's, it's a nice little buzzword, but when you talk about road safety and things like that, we really need to be quite serious about our risk and, and, um, and, our, and look after our community here as well. <laughs> and probably the other thing too, I know one of the recommendations talked about uh, the cost-benefit analysis. And I do note in this report it does state that the report states that the state government suggests that for every $1 invested in cycling infrastructure, five is returned in measurable public and private benefits. Um, and the notes from the, from the council office is that, however, this is not reflecting the department's own funding decisions as well. So I think that's probably important to make sure we have that, that sanity check. Like I said, I think the report is a great visionary piece of where we can head. And I think we just continue to be... Um, practical, pragmatic, and, and move forward with our active transport programs that we have. Open up for further discussion. Councillor Madsen? I guess some of those finer points are going to be a matter for public debate. Um, people will always have their own preferences in terms of infrastructure. Um, I'd rather talk about the Boone Ipswich Rail Trail briefly. I think it's one of the Ooh. best opportunities we have to deliver a tourism asset in our city. Um, people can choose how they want to identify Ipswich, but if you look at the work that's been done by council in our conservation estates and the addition to livability that we all get from having recreational walking trails and cycling trails, um, if you want a quality of life where you can get active in nature, I think we are on, on track to really be the best place in South East Queensland to live if you want that sort of lifestyle. And Big, there's just no reason to suggest that the Boone Ipswich Rail Trail wouldn't be as successful as the Brisbane Valley Rail yeah. Trail. None, none whatsoever. I would agree. And, yeah, our existing walking trails are amazing and we need to think of that as the identity of our city. Mm. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I also note one of the recommendations was to direct infrastructure stimulus spending to active transport and, and just note that um, of the stimulus money we received from the state and federal government. Um, quite a few of the programs, the state government one, we weren't able to contribute, but of the money that we have received, we are actually directing 8.6% um, towards that, that new shared path on, the, on uh, Bremer Street from Gordon Street to Bell Street. So we are, I just by very nature, I think culturally in our organisation, because our active transport plans are, are doing that. So I um, concur with that recommendation as well. Yeah. Any other discussion? Uh, just in closing, I think that, um, you know, the report, yes, is aspirational and, you know, and, it, and it's got... But it does have substance. There, mm. there, is, there is absolute merit to um, a lot of what the report has identified. Um, and it all boils down to the running commentary in the report that suggests that these things only happen uh, with political will yeah. and if we're prepared to back these things in. Yeah. I mean, you know, recommendation number four that I put forward to you all today is to consider uh, future development, um, to consider future development. Mm. You know, are we prepared to put our money where our mouth is? Mm. Are we going to go into budget discussions with this at the front of our mind? I think they're the questions... Um, that we as elected representatives need mm. to think about. And I think that that's probably the most, um, you know, pointed advice mm. uh, from 
the entire report. Thank you, Councillor Fickner. With that, I'll put um, recommendation A and B to the vote. Those in favour, please raise your hand. I see it's unanimous and it's carried. Thank you very much. And thank you, Councillor Fickner, for bringing this motion um, to us. We now go to item five, which, which is the Waste and Circular Economy Transformation Directive Update 2. May I ask for the Bill of Councillor Officer to come to the lectern, please? Can you state your name and title, please? Uh, Brett Davey, Waste and Circular Economy Transformation Manager. Good morning. Thank you very much. Could you please point out some of the highlights? Um, Mr Davey, you've been with us since the beginning of this new council in, in how we um, manage um, the challenges that we have and trying to find those opportunities. Could you sort of highlight some of the progress that has happened uh, uh, yes, since the last update? Yes. Uh, so you'll note that um, in the original recommendation that resolved to adopt the directive, there was a requirement for some quarterly progress updates. So I've obviously exceeded that by doing some monthly ones, at least early on. Um, it's been a bit like a duck, I suppose, that on the surface it looks relatively quiet, but underneath there's a fair bit going on. So um, I've been working um, particularly with uh, RIQ to set up some discussions with them. So that's a waste... Could you say which, what RIQ is? Yes, yes, the Waste and Recycling Industry Association of Queensland um, to progress the code of practice discussions on that front. And I've got meetings coming up with them tomorrow. Um, in terms of industry best practice um, opportunities, I have... Uh, visited just about every major waste facility in Ipswich so far and I'm starting to look further afield to look at other available technologies uh, and meeting uh, the operators in the context of my new role. So many of them I would have met in my former role. Then uh, we've had some fruitful discussions with the state and talking to them tomorrow uh, about the terms of reference for the joint task force and how we implement that moving forward. Um, so I'm confident we'll be able to have a the first meeting of the joint task force soon once we land obviously on the terms of reference. Uh, the compliance space uh, is one that will be addressed through the joint task force but also uh, one that I've discussed with the operators of uh, the relevant facilities in Ipswich and I've commenced discussions with the uh, operational leads in the Ipswich DES office, started to set up frequent meetings with them to talk about uh, the way that they are addressing compliance and responding to the complaints of the Order Abatement Task Force. I did note today that there are over 9,800 complaints to the Order Abatement Task Force now. Uh, I'm also participating in some discussions on the remediation front. Uh, so there's a university-led roundtable coming up to talk about opportunities, constraints and uh, the future of um, general voids that are left uh, remaining. That just isn't Ipswich, that's statewide, uh, but obviously relevant to the project. Uh, and I think that's about it. Unless there's any questions from the councillors. Mr Davey, you recently had a bit of a field trip with some senior... Public servants yes. from state government. Could you please outline what happened there? Yes, so uh, I invited several um, state government staff and bureaucrats to uh, attend and firstly talk about the, the terms of reference in the Joint Task Force and the directive and what it means uh, and what they can do and work with us in terms of the directive. Uh, but importantly, I took the opportunity to do a site tour, tour as well so they could actually see firsthand um, the areas of, of Swan Bank in particular and some of the waste operations in action. Uh, so quite fruitful uh, staff attended, including up to Deputy Director General level of the departments. And so that's, uh, I think, put us in a good place to continue the discussions on what the, the final terms of reference is for the Joint Task Force and the functions that we include within that. Okay. Um, Mr Javey, can I just ask, um, with regard to the... Um, uh, government officers that that came out and you, and you took them on a tour as you mentioned of you know Swan Bank New Chum area um, as we all know it's one thing to look at the um, I guess the the makeup and a number of waste operators within the space there and consider that in proximity to residential homes it's it's a very uh, different one to actually be on the ground and you get you know a much stronger sense of just how close it is to homes do you think they now have a different appreciation 
for that close proximity to, yeah. to residential mm-hmm. homes? Definitely there were several comments made regarding the difference to um, seeing it on the ground as opposed to looking at an aerial photography or some maps. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, which is absolutely absurd because our residents have been screaming out for years and years about the proximity mm. and, you know, they come out for this visit in 2021 and all of a sudden, you know, it's on their radar. Um, I mean, I know that's more of a, um, a comment, but I find that um, absurd and a little bit upsetting on behalf of the mm. residents. Um, just in terms of those site meetings that you were having... Um, you know, did, did you feel a positive response from some of those operators out there that they hear Ipswich City Council loud and clear in terms of our directive and, and moving forward to develop those, um, I guess, um, um, the best practice guide that RIQ will be helping us deliver? Are they giving you early signals um, to suggest that they're happy to come on board and start working with us more cooperatively? Uh, yes, they're all supportive of the directive. They're all supportive of, um, you know, the outcomes that we are seeking with the directive. Uh, they're very mindful of um, the role that they play in the community and the impacts that collectively the industry are having on the community and uh, very keen to fix it. Um, all of them, from discussions I've had with them, have already implemented measures on site and whilst uh, that hasn't necessarily... Uh, from observation resulted in a change in the number of complaints out of abatement task force. They are all very, very mindful of um, the need to be good neighbours and uh, to work with us on the waste future and they're also very mindful of the type of change that's coming uh, in the waste industry overall with the, the waste levy and some of that change has already started but the need to, um, to be better overall. And can I just ask, in relation to RIQ and your very early sort of preliminary discussions with them, are you getting um, a sense of, I guess, um, optimism optimism from them, given that any code of conduct is likely to be an opt-in scenario for their members? Are they giving any early indication if it's likely to be embraced or taken up by members? Yeah, I I think it will be uh, from my early discussions with them. And um, to be honest, they'd started talking about what the directive means uh, before I'd been appointed. So they were talking about this issue before Christmas. So, uh, yeah, I think that's very positive. Good. Would you agree that the speed with which um, waste in in Australia is moving (laughs) means that, you know... You know, from from a commercial perspective, they absolutely identify they need be, to be doing the right thing because it's going to get competitive, and um, and they want the market share. Uh, look, they acknowledge it's going to get harder, and um, some of the challenges that they're being faced with in terms of um, waste diversion, because obviously, last meeting I did talk a little bit about the idea that some of the things we're putting in the ground are resources. So they see that um, the diversion of waste is, um, is a growing industry and that there's going to be challenges accommodating that on current facilities. And that's, that's not just Ipswich, that's for all of South East Queensland, really all of Queensland, in having the right facilities of the right size and the right place to do all of these things. And um, the other challenge is the acknowledgement that we as individuals contribute to the outcome of the products on the site in that if we are putting the wrong thing in the wrong bin, it becomes a contaminant. So if we put the wrong things in our yellow top bin, that actually ends up being diverted straight to landfill rather than actually being properly recycled. So um, it's a double-ended argument. So on one hand, we've got to get them to do better. On the other hand, we have to do better so that we are actually making their jobs easier and more effective in a way. Mm. Through the Council Island. Um, Mr Davey, I was at a meeting uh, where the odour abatement team turned up this week. They tell me that they're closing their office at Red Bank Plains because they didn't get enough foot traffic through. But the plans that they've got in place, as I said to them, they were so excited that they're going to put up weather stations um, in different places. And I said to them, I've been on one of those committees for 20 years and they've had weather stations. They've got Um, number of phone calls, number of complaints over 20 years and they're saying, oh, we need you to keep bringing up so we can, you know, register these numbers. It didn't go down well. The community at Red Bank Plains was not happy with that sort of a response. I think that the department 
the state government department needs to step their act up. And, and the other thing that there was a bit of concern about was if people, if operators are taking um, waste out of what's coming in for landfill and storing it, they don't have to pay um, money on that because it's not going into landfill, but then what they can't recycle does go into landfill. Who's, who's um, monitoring that? So um, there's two arms of DES that you've discussed there. So the first arm is the environmental compliance side of things, and they deal with <laughs> compliance with environmentally relevant activities, and uh, they also link in with the odour abatement task force. So I can talk to them and just try and understand the issue that you've described, but from what I understand of looking at this issue, um, the complaints on their own aren't necessarily enough. So um, what you need to do is identify some of the meteorological um, effects in place on a particular day. So if there's a peak, and if you ever look through the history of the, the task force, you can actually see daily stats, and some days there are up to 100 complaints. And so if they are able to mirror those complaints with uh, meteorological data that's accurate, that will help to pinpoint the source of the odour, and odour is particularly problematic in this space. Um, the other aspect is the waste levy. So what you've just described is a resource recovery area. And so the impact of the waste levy is that there is a disincentive to put things in the ground into a hole. And there's an incentive to start to, before it goes in the hole, to sort out what you can. So at the moment, some facilities are getting roughly 50% out of that. And so the 50% isn't intended to be just stored. It's supposed to go to another facility or to be recycled on site. So the simple things, uh, timber, green waste, concrete, um, steel. And so that will get pulled out of the process. Now, if you have a look at the operation of a, a landfill, it does construction demolition waste. And that's usually the stuff that comes from a range of construction sites. It requires manual picking. So they'll have people in a picking station to go through it. And so the aim of the waste levy is to actually achieve that. Now, not through the, the method, but the outcome is that less material goes in a hole and more material gets considered to be a resource and gets reused. And that's, that's what the RA is. So the effect of the levy is that there's going to be more of that type of activity. OK, but I guess their question is, who's monitoring it? So they pull all this out, don't pay a levy on it, they mightn't be able to do anything with it or aren't interested in doing anything with it, and then it go, does go into the <coughs> ground, but they're not paying the waste levy on it. So yes. who's monitoring that? So the state are also monitoring that. They have a separate um, area that deal with waste levy in terms of waste levy payments, but also waste levy regulation. Okay. Yeah, and I've already I've been talking to those, those people as well. Well, you know, one of the gentlemen that was there, he said he's been on a waste committee since, um, or odour committee since um, 1995, and, you know, he said that all of those monitoring, wind monitoring and everything has been done, and they were saying they didn't know anything about it. So what happens to all of that information? Yeah, I'll seek some more information on that, Councillor, because I wasn't aware of that discussion you've described, but I'll, I'll have another conversation with my Thank colleagues you. about it. Councillor Dolly. Um, thanks, Mr. Davey. Just one question in relation to our resource recovery strategy. Did the um, the government heads that you spoke to, did they have any feedback in relation to that strategy? No, it didn't talk to them about it. They were certainly aware of the need for councils to do it. Yeah. Uh, I tried to focus on the the compliance and the the um, joint task force mobilisation rather than the resource recovery strategy. Yeah. Thank you. And Thank you. just to confirm, Mr Davey, um, you're having a meeting with the state tomorrow about starting up the task force? Is about the terms of reference, to talk through the terms of reference. So a, a, a draft terms of reference has been provided to the state to guide the, the formation of the task force. So. Oh, that's great news and something we can all celebrate. Yep. Mr Davey, um, I'm going to ask a question about having our community involved. It's really important for our community to have their voice heard. I know the Odor Abatement Task Force has been there. There's been over, what you said, 9,000 complaints made to there. Um, I know for myself, the first time I had residents tell me about this was in 2012. You know, I was in Red Bank, near Red Bank Plaza, and I had residents come up to me to tell me about the odours and about the issues with waste and things like that. So it's an ongoing issue for in our, in our city. Looking at this plan here, I can see that item protect our residential amenity does talk about a scope for a stakeholder engagement plan. Will that be including um, residents and community groups to have their say 
or where where does it fit in with this? Yeah, so we're building a stakeholder engagement plan at the moment. Uh, the objective of that is to deal with all aspects of waste that mm-hmm. are within council's remit um, and to work out the right communication pathway, so whether that be um, genuine engagement and these are the problems, let's talk about solutions, mm. or um, education and information. So um, relatively early in that phase, but we are building a plan to consider okay. uh, those aspects as well as um, the engagement of um, potential community reference groups and industry reference groups in this space. And I think it's important for us to listen to these people who have been fighting for over 10 years to, to be listened and heard. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Any other questions of Mr Davey? No, thank you very much. Appreciate thank it, you. Mr Davey. I guess opening up into conversation and discussion now... Sorry, I'll have to ask for a mover first. May I have a mover for, for this? Thank you, Councillor Jonick. And a second, I think, Councillor Fechner. Thank you. Moving into discussion, um, this is a really complex area. If it was really easy to fix, I, I think it would already have been done. And certainly if the City Council was able to fix all the issues that we're having, there, we would do that. Our appetite is there. I think, you can, I think residents know that. But we, we have to do it together. And I want to thank um, the State Government Minister Scanlon has made that commitment for the Joint ta- um, Task Force. She, she didn't have to, and so I'm really pleased uh, when, we, so when we talk about the senior officers from the, um, the different Queensland Government de- departments, it's nice <coughs> that they're there. Well, no, their minister has told them to be there, and their minister has told them that they need to work with us. And I think that's tremendous, and I'm really pleased with that the Queensland Government is doing that. And I also note, too, that when Mr Davey took the delegation around... Um, he did have them, he'd organised for them to be strategically situated at a certain cafe so they could smell the aromas of the, but unfortunately it was a rainy day so they didn't get to do that <laughs> another time, Mr Davey. Well, I'll open up for other discussion. I just want to note before the formalisation of the stakeholder management plan, um, Mr Davey, on behalf of Councillor Doyle and myself, has been contacting residents weekly um, who have concerns um, that pertain to anything in, in his portfolio whatsoever and is, and is managing that well. And I know that there's a list of people that will immediately be involved in this mm. and um, those community members, um, they absolutely know who they are. Yeah, I think it's really important that we'll have our Gary Residents Group as well as um, iRate and other community groups are also you know, involved in, in these as well. Yes, Councillor Madsen. I just wanted to make a comment uh, following on from Councillor Ireland's um, comments before. Um, it's a genuine thing that I sort of encounter across the part of Division 1 mm-hmm. in and around Swan Bank. People have had a gut full of reporting the odour. Um, it's just a, it's a joke, really, to just keep telling people to call up and then they see nothing physically okay. happen. Um, yeah, people are really upset about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's people there that live in the... Like, I don't, have, I don't understand that the township part of Ripley is actually its real name, but that area, um, over 20 years, they've been smelling it. Mm. And it took a very long time before they were heard. And they're just told to ring up every time still. Some of these people have rung up countless times already. They've lost track of how many times they've rung. Mm. Um, just to contextualise it. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, think it, I think it is a data collection exercise for the government, which, which we do need to have happen, yeah. But they would have the data already, is my point. It's, it's, it's went it, on long it's enough. Now the data for, is it's there. It's now fatiguing. Yeah. It is now fatiguing them. And, mm-hmm. and at what point is, you know, uh, you know more than, you know, 20,000 complaints enough to say, OK, well, there's a lot of residents in this one area that are experiencing this exact same issue. Um, it, it's an established issue and what are we doing mm-hmm. about it? If we as council treated our residents like that, it, it, there would be absolute uproar. Um, the fact that these people who complain about the smell don't even get uh, recognised with any follow-up from that saying, you were right, there was evidence that, that suggested, um, you, you know, this was impacting on you whatsoever, um, you know, but that's the role of Mr Davey in this role is to take these, you know, conversations to a higher level um, and really talk about how to make compliance more efficient and... Um, and actually achieve outcomes for our mm-hmm. residents. Mayor, um, Councillor Madsen and I have been to have a look at an in-vessel composting oh, unit, yes. 
and um, I would like to see the state government force all composters mm. into doing it because it was neat. It was there was odour when we went into the um, bin, yes. um, but it's all very scientifically done, so yes. it's not weighed weighted down with offal and oil. Um, I'd really like to see that the state mm. government would look at making that a condition for any composting unit. Thank you, Councillor Council Madsen. I, I just wanted to add, because, you know, you pop down to Coles to get some bread and milk at the Ripley Town Centre. There's hundreds of people there, and routinely that's, like, the area where everyone just... The odour's just incredible all the time. It's ridiculous how strong it is. And people have just... They, they don't ring up, even though hundreds of people experience it at that one point, you know, weekly, daily. It's, it's that extreme an issue. Yeah. I think that's where our role comes in, to make sure that our residents are, are heard. We've made sure that the, the state government have heard, the, the ministers, um, you know, on our side with, with the, the joint um, task force now, and that's what, what we will be continuing to do. <coughs> Absolutely. If there's no other discussion, I'll put the matter, this uh, update to the vote. Those in favour of accepting and noting it, please raise your hand. It's unanimous and carried. Thank you very much. Now we're going to jump to item 10 because it is about waste as per our procedural motion at the very beginning. And that's on the South East Queensland Council of Mayors Regional Waste Management Plan. And it's to rec this recommendation is that Council provide in principle endorsement of the draft South East Queensland Waste Management Plan as attached in this report. I just want to give a bit of um, strategy that there's a, quite a few moving parts in the waste area. Obviously with Council of Mayor, South East Queensland, there's this strategy piece being done, but also a piece of work that started, I think, over two years ago with this council, with, with Redlands and Logan and Lockyer on the sub-regional alliance. There was an EOI for a tender on, a, on that as well. So I just think that there's quite a few moving parts. We're making sure that we do it open and transparently, but also so um, we're not doubling up the workload as well. Um, would anyone like to ask the relevant council officer... Any questions on this? No? Then I'll ask for this particular item to be moved. Thank you, Councillor Fechner. And seconded, Councillor Milligan, thank you. We'll move into the discussion part. And I guess for me, I note that the attachment is confidential. There's a part of that attachment, and if you look over to the report on page 148, it talks about four key elements, the, the co-mingled recycling, the organics, the residual waste and enablers. I'd like to have a discussion with the Development Council about the residual waste area, which means I'm going to have to go into closed session because it is a confidential document. So I'm going to move. I don't like going to closed session, but it is a confidential document and it's part of ComSec. So um, I move that we go into... Sorry, Councillor Island. You're second. You're second. Okay, so I move that we move into a closed session to just... So I'd better read the proper thing according to the Act. I move that in accordance with Section 254J3 for closing the meeting in relation to uh, I, a matter of local government that is required to keep confidential under a law... Or, sorry, I'll state that again. I think it's a commercial and confidence matter involving local government for which a dis public discussion would be likely to prejudice the interests of the local government. Um, under the Local Government Regulation 2012, the meeting move into a closed session to discuss the, the residual, residual waste part of that confidential document. And I see Council Island says she'll second that. I'll then put that to the vote. Those in favour, please raise your hand. And it's unanimous. Thank you. Let me know when we're off.
Second to open. Thank you very much. Uh, we just have are coming out of a closed session. I just want to be upfront with the fact that as soon as we went into closed session, that we actually adjourned from 10.39 and came back to discuss things at 10.52 and they'll be reflected in the minutes. So my apologies. I'll make sure that that happens um, in open session in future, uh, but that will be reflected in the minutes. Um, in moving forward, we've already had... Okay. Not there. We've already had in the past that Council Effect removed this and Council Lincoln seconded that. I'll now open up for any discussion on the floor. <coughs> there being no discussion, I move the recommendation that Council provide in principle endorsement of the draft SEQ waste management plan um, as attached, uh, that confidential attachment to this report. Uh, those in favour, please raise your hand. And it's unanimous and carried. Thank you. We now move back to item seven. Which is the Planning and Environment Court Action Status Report. May I ask for the relevant council officer to come to the lectern, please? Please set your name and your position. Good morning, Anthony Bowles, Acting Development Planning Manager. Thank you, Mr Bowles. Going through the call action status report, the first item here um, with the applicant land track, and obviously we've got a few of these together. It was, right. I think, land track, clean away and BMI. That's right. Um, there is a, an appeal summary here, but could you lay it out in, in layman's terms what this actually means for us? In terms of the, With the, the status the of status, it? Um, yes. Well, basically, what's occurring, um, I'll just have to be conscious of the, yep. the, the matter at the hand, is uh, we have a hearing set down on 10th of May, as, as stated there. We're at the pointy end of preparing for the hearing, to be honest. That's the best way to put it, because we've got three appeals um, going essentially at once, three being heard at once, mm -hmm. so they'll be resolved at the same time, and they have inter intertwining matters um, and various legal teams working for each appellant and for ourselves. Um, so there, as part of that preparation, there's quite a lot of work that needs to be carried out, um, typically with experts, so the experts need to, to meet, just talk, talking generally, um, before they, um, they uh, prepare essentially for the hearing where it goes to in front of the judge and hear the, the views of the experts on all the matters of the appeal, all the matters of the refusals for each application. And the goal is to save all the applicants' um, time and effort when we're dealing with similar matters of refusal or similar matters of being, that are being um, resolved through those experts' opinions. So it's sort of a lot of information being funneled into one hearing at that, that 10th of May date. Okay. Thanks, Ross. Um, with Ida, with um, Edge Early Learning Holdings, Yep. Um, notice that um, the service was appellants seeking final orders on the 24th of March. Is there an outcome for that? That's right, yes. That so um, that matter was settled by consent order. Um, we, we agreed um, on the, the matters that were subject to the appeal, being the um, acoustic barrier and the acoustic standards mm -hmm. relating to that child care centre. So we, um, through negotiations, we agreed to settle the, the matter and it's been approved. So what was the outcome? Is it two metre or three metre? It's still two metres. Two metres, okay. Just out of curiosity, <clears throat> was that the eastern side? So opposite the... Um, the main... Centre? Uh, that, that's where the location is, yeah. So the... But the noise barrier, the one... The noise barrier was on the eastern side of the property, not, not directly beside the shopping centre. Uh, predominantly the northern side along the road, I believe. Um, oh, right. So the, it, it's a bit of an odd case in this particular matter that we were... Um, the matter in dispute relates to protecting the, um, p the occupants of the use right. from the road rather than the other yeah, way around. Yes. So 90% okay. of our acoustic matters that we deal with in acoustic... Uh, in childcare centres deal with um, isolating the noise or preventing the impacts of the noise. It's a little bit of a different case here. So um, it, there's a bit of negotiation and determining the appropriate standard to apply in that scenario. So that, that was some, that was without prejudice sort of discussions. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Bowles, on this report? 
No, thank you very much, Mr. Oh, be before awesome. I go, I do yes. have just one comment to make, yes. and it, it's not referenced in the attachments itself. Um, in the report, there's just a comment about a question from the last committee regarding the biorecycle application. Yes. Um, you'll notice that there, the second withdrawal isn't on this report. There was a bit of confusion on my part. The question related to um, biorecycle um, actually withdrawing an application rather than appeal. So that, that application was withdrawn, which is why it was not appearing okay. on the, the list. Wonderful. Um, and one other piece of news that might be of interest given the recent discussions, again, not appearing on the, the court, only happened the other day, uh, is there an entry of appearance into the um, Planning Environment Court from the department relating to the Newgo site, um, issuing an environmental protection order to Newgo, um, specifically relating to uh, the recent rain and some discharge that occurred from the site. Um, so that, that happened quite recently. I was advised of it, I think, just yesterday. So... Um, it's the Queensland Government. That's right. That? Yeah. So that right? was the Chief Executive of the Department of Environment and Science that mm -hmm. filed an entry of appearance to issue the Environmental Protection Order. So that's some action from the state on the yeah. non-compliance of the approval. That's right. So I thought I'd mention that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wells. Now I have a mover for, the, for this report. Thank you, Councillor Doyle. Seconder. Thank you, Council Island. I'll open it up for any discussion. There being no discussion, I'll put the report to the vote. Those in favour, please raise your hand. It's unanimous and passed. Thank you. We'll now move on to item H, the exercise of delegation report. Would anyone like to speak to the relevant council officer on this report? No? I then ask for a mover. Thank you, Council Fickler. And a seconder. I think you can Deputy Mayor. I'd like to open up for any discussion. There being no discussion, then I propose you put this report forward. Those in favour, please raise your hand. It's unanimous and passed. Thank you. We now go to item nine, which is the IED Capital Portfolio Financial Performance Report. May I ask for... Uh, Mr. Madigan to come to the lectern, please. Good morning, Sean Madigan, uh, General Manager of Infrastructure and Environment. Thank you, Mr. Madigan. <coughs> I appreciate that you've only taken over this role in the last few months. Mm -hmm. And we're coming to the end of the financial year. We've had discussions about, um, I guess, the under delivery of, of this capital works program. Uh, when you take away the um, savings that are identified, and there's a couple of projects that have been deferred, we're still looking at about 9.2% of the work being deferred or not completed, mm. which is of concern uh, to us. Um, that's, you know, the, the residents do expect service delivery. What will you be, be doing to address that? <coughs> uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so as, as discussed previously, the... Uh, process uh, by which uh, we commence uh, our capital delivery um, program. Uh, essentially, if you look at this year, uh, it's what we call a back-ended program. So what would traditionally occur is that the council uh, would approve the uh, capital program and the adopted budget uh, in May and June. Uh, mm -hmm. We would then commence the, the process um, of around design, uh, procurement and construction. What that means is that the vast majority of, of actual construction and, and therefore spend occurs uh, in the current month, so March, mm -hmm. April, um, May and into June. Um, what that then does is, is, is doesn't enable a lot of slippage for mm -hmm. extensions of time for weather and, and the like uh, or changes to program. So what we as a department uh, have done is, is we're in the process uh, of an organisational realignment <coughs> um, by which uh, we're creating a capital delivery branch um, that incorporates uh, the design team, um, the procurement and construction team and the portfolio and program coordination team. Uh, in order to achieve that, what we have started this year um, through some great work uh, from our design team um, is to get ahead of the game. So we are currently in the process of designing and commencing early procurement steps uh, for the capital delivery program uh, to be adopted uh, by <coughs> council. Um, and what that will mean is that we will be able to commence works in July, August, September uh, of next year instead of waiting till February, March, April, May to actually deliver on it. Uh, we believe as a group um, that 
the uh, draft capital program that we have put forward to the councillors is a program that we can in fact deliver um, and we remain confident uh, of that occurring. The next few months are pretty significant over for us in terms of the spend, so um, there is a lot going on at the moment. There's 125 projects being delivered um, as we speak at present. <coughs> uh, the month of uh, April in particular is a key month. It's the largest spend uh, of the, the year when it's phased out. Um, the weather predictions look good, so it means that a lot of the, the road rehab and reseals will continue. Um, so we, we remain confident of meeting the, the projected, uh, I think it's 70 million it was reduced to recently, um, with being within around about 5% of that come the end of this financial year. Uh, and then next year's uh, program, uh, we remain confident that we can actually deliver it. So all of the team uh, in IED is on board um, with this proposal. So um, in order to achieve these, what I would see, operational efficiencies, we asked the, the various areas of the, the department as to you know, how we can be better uh, structured and in terms of our processes to actually get ahead of the game. Uh, and we believe that, that what we have put in place um, will put us in a, in a great position. Um, we have also added additional resources into mm -hmm. the design team, um, the construction and project management team, um, to deliver on that capital portfolio. Uh, and as I said, in particular, the design team has really stepped up um, to the mark to get us ready to really um, you know, hit the ground running uh, come the 1st of July next year, which is significantly different to the project process that it was 12 months ago. Absolutely. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Mr May, if I go to page 140... Of the report. So I'm looking at the sub program summary asset rehabilitation and line 1.9, the sealed road rehabilitation. <coughs> I can see that we've, um, I think we had it budgeted for about 15 million. We, we end up spending nearly um, 19 million on the sealed road rehabilitation. Are we mm. resealing more roads or is it costing more? Is there a reason for the nearly three and a half million? Sorry, what page is that on there? On mine it says um, 140 of 229. Mm -hmm. Or page 3 on the little blue writing. Might refer to the CFO. Sorry? Could refer to the CFO. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's uh, just to clarify, yeah. Um, it's actually an underspend, I think. Is that correct, Mr. CFO? <coughs> mm. That's right, yeah. Some of that um, was from the, the costs involved. You're not going to deliver that? Mm, yeah. Okay. There was a, a delay in the procurement for the asphalt contract, um, which was a significant uh, impact on that. Um, that contract is now in place. Yep. Uh, so what we will see um, yet again, unlike mm -hmm. this year, um, that contract is in place. The capital program uh, is adopted. So effectively, the resealing uh, is occurring as we speak mm -hmm. uh, and will continue through to June. And then as of 1 July, it will be able to continue on under the existing yep. contract and the three-year capital program endorsed by Council. Um, so that is, as a result, as I said, a combination of factors of a procurement delay, um, some savings um, in terms of expenditure, but predominantly around, as I said, that preparation to deliver on, on, on the program straight so away as of 1 of July. Absolutely. Of that 6.4 million mm. delivery. Thank you. And I can see that we've... Um, um, I guess we've overspent on our curb and channel rehab, which probably need to, <coughs> and gravel road rehab as well. Thank you. I don't know. have any further questions for Mr Madigan. Yep, that's all. Mr Madigan, I see that the um, um, projects Mary and William Street signals uh, mm. have been delayed again. Um, I didn't realise that we didn't have all of the property. It says it's due to delays with property acquisitions. Mm. All yes. we were told last time was it was service uh, <coughs> relocations. Mm. How many corners don't we have? There are three property owners that we're, we're in um, conversations with at the moment in relation to property acquisition. Um, this is... Um, to be completely honest, as a result of, of poor planning potentially on behalf of ourselves in, in terms of that, um, uh, the compartmentalised nature um, of the infrastructure department as it was in terms of delivering capital uh, resulted in, in uh, gaps such as this emerging. So um, the new structure of better planning means that you know we'll be well forward on this and working with our property team. So. Um, we will put our hand up to say that this is a forward planning issue, that this should have been resolved some time ago by my department. Um, <coughs> but, um, you know, unfortunately, 
you know, property acquisitions are, are somewhat complex and can be protracted depending upon the appetite uh, of the resident um, to, to work with us. Uh, so while, while there is slippage there, the, the works will still continue, so we're confident we will reach agreements on those property acquisitions, um, but it has, the delay is as a result of poor planning. My fellow councillor and I have been out telling the people of Blackstone that money's coming, we're fixing it up. Mm -hmm. Do we have a date that we can now change to, or <coughs> is this all open? No, if it's okay, I'll take that on notice um, and I'll respond um, to both of yourselves with the date of when we expect those works to commence. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Mr. Madigan? Just Council a final Pickens? question. With the program of works, um, that we'll be adopting for the next three years. Mm. Um, is that smaller than, than last financial year's commitment in terms of the year on year so as to be able to achieve the entire program of works? Yeah. Uh, the, <coughs> sorry, the, the, the draft program that's been presented to you is significantly more. So I think it currently sits at around 102 to $103 million. Um, but bearing in mind the large portion of those costs are in two projects, being the SGA duplication and Red Bank Plains Road Stage 3. Um, sorry, the stages of that. That's where the significant cost comes in. Um, in terms of actually, so if you were to pull out, say, as you, as you would the SGA duplication, then you're looking at around about a $70 million capital program, which isn't vastly different. Uh, what we have done as part of the, the restructure uh, process in IED is we're creating a major project section under the capital delivery and to enable that to proceed, and as you know, we're commencing works down at SGA. Yeah. Um, we have brought on an additional project manager to specifically manage that project. Um, we've also brought on <coughs> an additional stakeholder engagement officer for that project. So there will be an actual consolidated team that focuses on those, those significant projects, being SGA and Red Bank Plains. Um, what that then does is, is we are resourced adequately to deliver on more. Um, the contracts, um, SGA duplication, uh, BMD being the, the major contractor there, so those works will continue. Once you engage a principal contractor like that, um, in many ways, aside from <coughs> the stakeholder engagement aspect and community engagement aspect, that contract you know, will get on and build those works. Um, so <coughs> as I said before, the draft capital program that we have presented to you, we have um, across the board of the entire department and all the various disciplines interrogated that heavily. Uh, to ensure that what we do say um, we are going to deliver, we do in fact deliver. Um, and the, the team is very confident. The steps, as I've mentioned before, about getting ahead um, of the game that we are taking now, um, <clears throat> you know, everyone's excited about it. Um, everyone sees the value in it. Uh, and, um, you know, we won't be putting forward uh, a capital delivery program that we can't deliver. So future discussions um, will be around <clears throat> potentially... You, know, you will always get some delays on, on some projects, but it will be nowhere near the extent uh, of what you see here and the bu budget reductions that have had to occur over the last 12 months. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Madigan. Thank you. Thank you. Would I like to ask any other questions of any other council officer? No? I'll then ask for this report to be moved. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. <coughs> to be seconded. Thank you, Councillor Pickman. Just moving discussion, I guess um, it's heartening to see that, um, in particular, to point out the sealed roads rehabilitation, um, of, of that under delivery of three point um, three and a half million dollars. I mean, our core business in council is this roads, rates, and rubbish, and it's really important that we do maintain that. So I'm delighted to hear that the design team in this division is going to be boosted, but also the creation of that capital delivery branch to be really focused on delivering for residents. That's that's a really good um, move forward. Thank you. Any other discussion? No, I'll put the report to the vote. Those in favour, please raise your hand. I think it's unanimous and passed. There being no other, no other notices of motion, no other matters arising, no other procedural motions and <coughs> formal matters, just like to thank you, Ms Cooper, your first GIW, thank <laughs> you for your support. And we'll um, close the meeting now at 11.16 with the next one happening obviously in 10 minutes' time. So there's that, um, we'll make it 11.30 for the next meeting? 11.30. 11.30? Start, okay. Yeah.